For my presentation today, as my title suggests, my interests lie in examining the nexus between personal, cultural, and national histories in the construction of oral historical narratives by migrants, in this case, by Ethiopian migrants living in Canada. With a particular focus on Ontario, I examine the role of history and the macro, meso, or mid-level, and macro structures of migration at play in life, sorry, in the life trajectories of migrants. This is largely a historical project, and the study is qualitative by nature. The case studies are utilized to show the occurrence of themes and patterns, which I intend to examine further as I progress further into my dis dissertation research. I'm also going to take a minute here to pretext my talk by mentioning that I'll be using the first names of research participants with the prefixes ATO or TA where appropriate. ATO and TA being the empirical equivalent to Mr. and Mrs. and kind of significant because of the fact that they're a sign of respect, especially when someone is of my elder. The Ethiopian diaspora in Canada, like many migrant groups, has been strongly shaped by concepts of history, memory, and identity over the course of the 20th century. At the micro level, as much as 30 years out of their country of origin, through their narratives, migrants often express the strong sense of attachment that they felt to their native geographical loci. From vivid and elaborate references to local sites, to recollections of fresh fruits and temperate weather, migrants express their deep felt bond to Ethiopia as home. As Ato Omar, one of my participants, succinctly expressed at separate times during his interview, he expressed, I love my country, and I am still mentally there, even though I am physically here. His statements are not emphasized to highlight the fact that Ato Omar may or may not be economically or socially integrated in Canada. In fact, for all intensive purposes, he is. He has lived in Canada for over 30 years and he has overcome barriers and challenges inclusive of blatant racism to establish himself within his career of 27 years. He has raised two educated and successful children who likely identify as dual identity. He is now living the Canadian dream, the life of freedom in existence occupied by work, family commitment and everyday life. Instead, when put in context with the remainder of the interview session, his statement is indicative of his duality in being calling attention to his identity and his history, along with that of thousands of other Ethiopians who have left the region. For Ato Omar and thousands of others like him, the coup of 1974, which resulted in the overthrowing of Emperor Haile Selassie and the subsequent Red Terror years provided the first big impetus for many people from various regions of what was the Ethiopian nation to flee in fear for their lives. Moreover, with the onset of two brutal decades of civil war between the Derg and the multiple oppositional liberation forces in the Eritrean region, migration was also fueled and many nationals left to various other parts of the world throughout the 1980s. Even after the liberation of Eritrea in 1992, migration to North America continued to increase as many migrants left in search of better lives and opportunities abroad. Although subject to further investigation, my research has so far illustrated the fact that Canada is often a secondary or a third destination for migrants who have ended up making a life here. In the oral historical narratives, there are frequent references to migrants or relatives having lived in or passed through Djibouti, Saudi Arabia, Italy, and or Greece prior to their arrival and settlement here, particularly in Ontario. A key informant of my study brought the role of the coup of 1974 to my attention. As I had already discovered this through the archival records, he highlighted a fact I hadn't really quite thought of. In one of our multiple sessions, Atul Muhammad asserted that there are distinctions to be made between the pre-1974 and post-1974 diaspora. He left Ethiopia prior to the 1974 revolution and through personal observations and his settlement in Canada, he asserts that the immigrant generation that migrated during the pre-1974 years is reflective of the dynamic and open Ethiopian society in which he grew up, a mosaic and integrative kind of, integrative kind of society found in the Deridewe region of Ethiopia during the 1950s. His further observations are that in recent migration years, that network has been dismantled because in the post-1974 years, quote, they lived a different and traumatic experience, end quote making it very difficult to relate to one another in the same manner as before. Much in line with Atta Muhammad's social observations, when examining archival resources regarding Ethiopia and or Ethiopians within Canada, a clear delineation of time is evident in the way the sources depict both the Ethiopian nation and the Ethiopian people. In Canada, 
much like in the rest of the world. Ethiopia was held in high regard throughout the first half of the 20th century under the rule of Emperor Haile Selassie. For those of you who are not familiar, he is the one sitting on the throne depicted in the middle picture there. It was not until the entrance of the Marxist Derg regime in 1974 that discourses on Ethiopia and Ethiopians shifted largely from favorable praise for the Christian kingdom or monarchy to rhetoric embedded with Cold War politics. Ironically, social representations and perceptions of Ethiopia and Ethiopians in Canada also shifted during a period of time when more Ethiopians were immigrating into the country. Where a generation earlier, Canadians were familiar with Emperor Haile Selassie and the ancient kingdom of Abyssinia through favorable media coverage and positive cultural exposure, exemplified here by a few archival resources, primarily the two pictures from Expo 67. This one here is the Ethiopian Pavilion in Montreal. That one is a picture of the cultural dancers at that exhibition. CBC documentary footage and the Emperor's visit of 1967 were widely distributed and largely favorable. But by the time of the rule of the Derg, popular discourse on the Ethiopian nation had shifted to harsh criticism of a new regime that was engaged in civil strife and losing battles with epic famines. Both implicitly and explicitly, these macro-structural political shifts directly impact the ways in which migrants from this region narrate their personal life trajectories and define their identity along with how they interpret both their cultural and national history. Knowledge of both the political and the cultural history is integral to understanding what people choose to talk about and to understanding when and how they choose to talk about them. For instance, the devastating famines in Ethiopia and the subsequent media coverage impacted the lives of migrants daily. Being an Ethiopian became enshrouded in a post-colonial gaze of the impoverished subaltern. As one informant characterizes this early state in his migration and integration of story, he says, quote, Being from Ethiopia, and with all those jokes about being hungry, I will never forget the time that these guys were all eating lunch, and they motioned for me to come and join them at the table. I just looked over, and one of them says, Oh, watch out. He's going to eat our leftovers. He must be hungry. To imagine a reaction like that in a professional setting where you're already feeling a little uncertain is a little unsettling, to say the least. Consequently, a generation later, the children of migrants seek alternate representations of their heritage, only to be confronted by the fact that these representations and perceptions have held fast. How else can it be explained that in spite of the large numbers and visibility of Ethiopians within the Toronto area, it is still hard for Sarah, born and raised in Toronto, to find positive reinforce reinforcements of her heritage outside of her community. With the exception of her involvement with young diplomats in high school, a youth cultural association, Sarah asserts that within the classroom context, open quote, number one, I've never heard Ethiopia being represented in Canada. Any call from the media would usually be in a negative context or connotation. It is in contrast to these steadfast representations and perceptions that participants assert the following statements. It is striking that at some point in conversation with any migrant above the age of 50, regardless of gender, the following types of historical references and assertions will occur. Esther says it best in her summary that, in my country, we have never been colonized. As much as we are free, we are God-fearing people. Respect, loving, and helpful. Most Ethiopians are like that. Cultural associations facilitate the perpetuation of both Ethiopian culture and history. Associations facilitate commemoration and offer sites for interpretation and representation of national and cultural histories. Locally, I was recently invited to an Ottawa Day celebration at the Cross-Cultural Learner Center, and I was struck by what I saw at this event. On the walls of the room were Bristol board posters that were clearly compiled by various children throughout the five years that this celebratory event has taken place. History felt alive, and it was felt and expressed in the care and pride that was taken to create these commemorative pieces, as much as it was by the people in the room who were talking about the events. Families arrived, and women put out traditional finger foods and pop. The program was in Amharic, a language I no longer read, but luckily my translator kept me informed of what was to be expected. We watched a series of English interviews with prominent Ethiopian historian Richard Pankhurst, all related to the famous Battle of Ottawa in 1891. What struck me the most was the presentations that were done by three young teens. The collated research and the interpretations reinforced, reinforced the themes that I addressed earlier. History matters. 
they actually largely, it was really interesting to find that um, there was a gendered perspective as well. So unlike the usual representations in historical literature on the Battle of Ottawa, there was a lot more focus on the role of Empress Taitu, which I thought was really kind of neat. Um, within the diaspora, this is a contested history. There are people who vehemently disagree with the narrative of Emperor Menelik and Empress Taitu as the hero and heroine. Some have expressed pride in not being a colonized nation in Africa. It was the bravery of our, forefath our forefathers who kept the Italians at bay. However, in the same breath, one of my participants says, Menelik made Ethiopia one by force. Whether we agree or disagree, the people of the South, they suffered a lot. Somehow they got conquered and they became one. If Menelik was smart, he would have put a federal system. But we are not going to rewrite history. But that was a mistake. History is consequently also embedded in diaspora politics with material consequences for the present. What my research participant re referred to is the rise of Oromo nationalism and the idea that in, within Canada, there are people who contest the label Ethiopian. In conclusion, case studies illuminate patterns and highlight elements to historical narratives that would not be present when only single questions are asked. When in conversation about personal history, the personal truly becomes illustrative of the national, the political, and the cultural. There are always big themes explicitly or implicitly embedded in these personal conversations. Moreover, ranging from the role of the Anglican Church in migration facilitation, as one of my uh, immigrant subjects lightly furnished for my topic, she was very much um, facilitated to Canada with her role as both she continued to serve as a facilitator of immigrants to others because of her facilitation of migration to Canada through the Anglican Church. Um, moreover, ranging to the job training that was implemented by the YMC in Ethiopia, there are often multiple intermediary structures that have played an integral role in the life trajectory of the individual narrative. In the case of Ethiopian outmigration, it can be stated that identities are mobile. As Esther so eloquently put it, who you are does not change by where you are. A significant undercurrent in the construction of narratives, a theme that gets revisited in each of my conversations, whether it be with young or old. With well over 50,000 people reportedly living in, living in the Ontario region, when asked about visibility and expressions of Ethiopian identity in Canada, Sarah pointedly addresses this with her quote, I feel like every country has their own. I feel like the jebana is like the maple syrup to Canada. The Jebana is that giant coffee pot that's in the middle of the uh, field there. That's actually representative of the Kafir region. It's embedded with history. It's imbued with cultural significance. Lots of symbolism there. It's also fraught with cultural history. The Bunar coffee ceremony is a cultural practice that is rooting for many. And many mothers engage in making sure that the children continue this uh, phenomenon. It is through symbols and practices that cultural history is transmitted. Heritage is significant to both those young and old. Sarah put it best in her expression of desire to learn how to cook Ethiopian food. I am really proud of my Ethiopian heritage. Like I love that I'm Ethiopian and I feel like it's a great thing. When I have kids, I don't want them to be completely out of touch with it. I fear that could happen because I have nothing to offer them. I know I feel I have the language, but unless my husband is Ethiopian and he somehow knows the language, it's not going to be communicated throughout the house in terms of culture. It will only dissipate. So in summary, these case studies illuminate patterns and highlight elements to historical narratives that would not be present when one is only asked how they arrived to Canada. Narratives of migrants illustrate the utility of understanding and interpreting the macro, meso, and microstructures at play in the formation of identities and how these identities are closely linked to both history and place. Thank you.